right, hello everybody. So yesterday we talked about uh, Le Chatelier's principle and I laid out the basics for you in terms of what would happen if we had these different stresses, temperature, concentration, and pressure. And I talked to you about, you know, what a shift was and what a stress was. And I just want to recap that here before we move on to the next part of the notes. And so, you know, what does it mean um, if you have a shift? And what should I be mindful of when I think about Le Chatelier's principle? And first of all, um, the one thing that's really important to remember is that the reaction takes place in one chamber. There's not a left and a right chamber. Like a lot of times people get caught up and they're like, oh yeah, you know, it shifted left, it shifted right. And they almost picture two containers in their mind. And you can almost think of it like, you know, here's my one container and I have my reaction inside my one container that I'm holding up if you look at my uh, image in the lower right hand corner. And so, you know, this is my one container. And if I stress it out, I stress out everything in the container. I'll stress out the reactants and the products. And so that's important that you understand that, that the stress, the stress is applied to the whole system. Now, things to remember about shifting is that when you shift left, that means that the reverse reaction is favored. And that means that relative to the forward reaction, the reverse reaction will be occurring faster. That could happen because the forward reaction slows down, or that could happen because the reverse reaction actually does speed up. But either way, the reverse reaction is going to be favored. What this also means is that the reacting concentration will increase and the product concentration will decrease. Now, if you shift to the right, um, what that means is that you have the forward reaction being favored. And that would be the opposite now. Now the reacting concentration will go down and the product concentration will go up. Now when they want an answer in, um, in on the Regents exam, they want you to say things like, okay, you know, in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, which way will the reaction, you know, what will happen to the reaction? And when they say in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, what they really want you to do is they want you to actually go through and say it'll shift to the left, it'll shift to the right. A lot of times they'll tell you like, oh, the products increased. What happened in terms of Le Chatelier's principle? And then you just have to know, oh, it shift to the right. They don't really require an in-depth explanation of this stuff. Okay, so, um, so now I gave you this practice to do and I did some of it for you. Um, and so, you know, just to fill out the rest of it, which we'll do in class um, before you actually see this video, but just to go through the rest of it in case you, you know, were confused in class. If I increase H2, that means that's a reactant. So the um, N2 will go down and the H and H3 will go up, will shift to the right. If I decrease H2, the opposite happens. H2 increases and H3 decreases. Um, if I increase NH3, I'll shift to the left, increase and increase of the reactants. If I decrease NH3, I will decrease the reactants as I try to make more product. I increase temperature on the last video, so if I decrease temperature, the opposite will happen. Um, we will favor the exothermic reaction. I'll increase the reactants, decrease the products. Increasing pressure, I'll shift to the side with less moles, so I'll increase the amount of NH3 and I will decrease the amount of H2 and N2. So, you know, this shows you, uh, you know, the rest of this chart. If you try to fill it out, you can check it now against this. In class, we also did this chart as well. Um, and um, I can post my notes as well, and you can see those. You'll see them when you look at the posted notes, what the answers to these are in case you missed it in class. What I really wanted to um, get to for this part of the video was something called KSP and talk to you a little bit about that. We'll come back to this slide and then we'll talk about common ion effect once we've done KSP. It'll make a lot more sense. And we'll also talk about how to force a reaction to completion. So let me introduce a little bit um, to you about what KSP is. 
KSP, it stands for solubility product. So this stands for solubility product. It's used for salts that are considered to be insoluble. So it's, you know, not something that we see all the time. With insoluble ionic salts, when you look on table F, and what we learned was that if you have an ionic salt that's insoluble, it does not dissolve. But it turns out that there is a little bit of dissolving going on. Even insoluble ionic compounds can make some amount of ions, but it's a very, very small amount, and you're going to see that. And so let's say I had, if I went to table F and I had this salt PBSO4, if I look on table F, it'll actually show up as being insoluble. The thing is this, though, is that PBSO4 does still dissolve a tiny little bit. And some of the ions from the PBSO4 will still break up and form an aqueous solution. And this is the equation for this dissociation, as it's called. Now, for this, since it's a reversible reaction, when the reaction is saturated and at equilibrium, I can actually write a KSP, a KEQ for this. And when I do that, I get this, and the line here is cut off, but there's really a products over reactants. But this is a solid on the bottom here, and so I cross it out, and I'm left with just my KSP, my solubility product, my ions. All KSPs just show the products, which are the ions that have dissolved in solution. If I'm not at equilibrium, then I'm not considered to have a K value. I have a Q value. A Q and a K value are basically the same thing. The only difference is, is that the Q will not be the same number as the K until we've reached equilibrium. So how do I do a problem with this? Well, here's a problem where I want you to determine KSP from the solubility. So for example, continuing with PBSO4, we have, our, um, we have our salt that has this solubility, grams per milliliter. The first thing I need to do is change it into concentration, molarity. So I take the grams, and instead of grams per milliliter, I make it grams per liter. I times it by 1,000 milliliters for every one liter. And I then change it to moles per liter. I times it by one mole over the gram formula mass, and I get moles per liter of the molarity. Now I do a simple ice table, which I show down here. This is my E column. It started at zero. I then do plus x and plus x, and at equilibrium, I will have x and x. I already know what x is because I solved for it up top here. And now I can just plug that into my KSP, which is x times x, or x squared, and I can get my KSP value. Notice again, no units for KSP. So go ahead and try this with something like PBF2. So again, you've got to change the grams per liter to moles per liter. So that should be easy. You then have to write a KSP or I should say write a chemical equation first. Once you write a chemical equation for this, then the third thing that you would do is you would write your KSP. You would then plug the values from one into the KSP. Now be really careful with this one because in fact, What's happening here is that the, um, there's two F minuses that are forming, and writing the equation is really important. So X won't be the same for both of them. You'll have X and you'll have two X. Write it out. See if you can figure out what I'm talking about to do that. Okay, the opposite could happen too. We could calculate what the solubility is if we're given KSP. So in this case, I'm going to start from the opposite. I'm going to write a, an equation first. So here's my equation. This is what forms from my KSP. Let me just move that over. I got ahead of myself here. I'll just move this over because this came from CaOH2. So now, um, I have my ions. 
And now I could write my KSP for this. My KSP is going to be equal to CA plus 2 OH minus squared. If we write out our, our ice table, we have x and 2x as our final. But again, this started with, if we start from the beginning, 0 and 0 plus x plus 2x, x and 2x. We can now take those and plug those into the KSP. And we'll have KSP equals x times 2x squared. The KSP we know, 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6 equals 4x cubed. That came from the 2x being squared times another x gave us 4x cubed. We can now solve for this, and if we go ahead and we solve for this, we would have our 6.5 times 10 to the negative fifth divided by 4, and then we could raise that answer to the 1 third power, or just take the cube root if you know how to do that in your calculator, and we'll get 0 0.025 molar. So x will be equal to 0 0.025 molar. Now, it depends on what they're asking us for. If they want the concentration of just x, this is called the molar solubility. If they want the concentration of OH minus, you'd have to times that by 2 and get 0.05 molar. Okay, so, um, so these are my types of KSP problems. If you want to compare solubility of two different salts, then what ends up happening is you need to use um, you need to use the molar solubility, or sometimes you can use the KSP. Now I'm looking at the time here, and I see that I'm up to about 12 minutes. So I'm going to cut off the video now and not rush through the rest of this. Um, the next video I will do the last part of KSP, and I'll also go back and I will um, and I will do. Um, I'm sorry, I'll also go back and I will also do um, the Le Chatelier's principle stuff that I didn't do this time. All right, thanks so much for watching.